This might be the story of history's biggest secret. A hidden world of secret cities and classified nuclear facilities built inside America. 400,000 people were part of it, though only a handful really knew the truth. They told us exactly what to do and not to tell anybody. It took up half a million acres of land. It saw the construction of the largest building in the world. It cost billions of dollars. And all these resources were focused on one goal, bringing an end to World War II by building the world's first atomic bomb. Six decades on, a team of experts returned to the once classified sites where the course of history was decided. In green valleys and dry deserts, they will uncover and rebuild this lost world. The army tore down the entire community called Happy Valley. It's gone. Using the latest in computer technology and new evidence, the team will uncover the most complex feat of engineering ever undertaken. This is the lost world of the Manhattan Project. Oak Ridge, Tennessee. In 1941, this was still a remote farming area. Within two years, according to classified plans and maps, it was a secret city. The government realized that this project was going to take many, many workers. So they began to design a city that ultimately would hold 75,000 people. It was going to be the home to the biggest secret of World War II. The government pretended it didn't exist because this was part of Project X, the Manhattan Project, the race to build the first atomic bomb. Historian David Bradshaw explores modern day Oak Ridge. He's hunting for clues to its secret wartime past. In 1939, a group of scientists, Albert Einstein among them, had warned President Roosevelt of the possibility that Hitler's Germany might be close to producing an atomic bomb. Roosevelt issued an order. Whatever it took, the U.S. had to be the first to develop an atomic bomb. One man, General Leslie Groves, was given unprecedented authority and unlimited funds to make it happen. He would need them. Well, theoretically, of course, a bomb was possible in terms of uh, the physics of it, but uh, engineering and all of the other many things that had to go into uh, the make making an actual combat weapon uh, were quite unknown, so this was a pretty big gamble to start off on. Land was the first requirement. The engineers knew that the processes to create the bomb would be very labor-intensive. Groves set up facilities in New Mexico, in Washington State, and here at Oak Ridge, Tennessee. David Bradshaw has been searching through the archives to find out how the Oak Ridge facility was set up. He's found documents showing that Groves commandeered 59,000 acres of farmland. An area roughly twice the size of Washington, D.C. was about to be transformed. Leslie Groves selected this site to become the, the site for the Manhattan Project. If you had looked out here in 1941, you would have simply seen rolling farmland, homes, barns, outbuildings, very rural, very much the way it had been for 100 years. Uh, they picked this site because of its protection. A study of the layout shows how this land perfectly suited Grove's needs. The ridges that surround the land would shield what happened here from prying eyes. And the project wasn't just secret, it was high risk. If something went catastrophically wrong, the ridge might protect the local population from a blast. In September of 42, uh, the thousand farm owners here received a very short letter which said, by December of 1942, you must be off your property. 
farmers whose families had been working the land for generations were given only a few weeks' notice to quit. The only explanation given was that this land would be used for the war effort. Once the land was clear, the first priority was security. Probably one of the first security buildings built was this one, and it's probably one of the last original ones still standing. These high towers were built to keep the site under constant surveillance. It was as heavily guarded as a high security prison. You entered uh, probably through a spiral staircase. There were machine gun ports, gigantic searchlights above us. None of the trees on this ridge would have been here, so the ability to have 360 degree security would have been tantamount, and I'm sure that's why they selected this spot. From his investigations, David Bradshaw has been able to uncover the details of the security placed in and around Oak Ridge. The site was placed under guard and access restricted. No one entered without high level clearance. All traffic in and out was channeled through seven fortified checkpoints. Oak Ridge was cut off from the outside world. For the next three years, no site in the United States was more important, more closely watched, or more secret. And yet Groves had to bring tens of thousands of workers here. He had to quickly build a whole new town from scratch. A private company was given the task. The initial brief, as shown on these plans, was to create homes for 13,000 people scientists, engineers, soldiers, construction workers, laborers. This new community would need shops, hospitals, schools for their kids. At the project's peak, 75,000 people would live here. An investigation of what remains of the secret city at Oak Ridge today offers clues to the incredible speed with which this community was built. Just off the sidewalk here are some of the very first houses in Oak Ridge, E-apartment buildings probably completed in August of 1943, built very, very quickly. This house, this house, this house, all the foundations would have been laid. Then the framers would have come in the next day and framed maybe a dozen houses in a day. Then the plumbers, electricians, finally the finishers, and people would have moved in maybe one every hour as these came off the, the, off the production line really built only to last for 10 years or so. 60 years later, they're still with us. This new town would be a model of suburban uniformity. What marked out Oak Ridge was its secret mission to build the bomb. The Army's next challenge was to entice workers here, and so they produced this document. It's really interesting. It's, it's marketing by the Army. They knew people didn't want to be coerced into Oak Ridge, but attracted. And so they, they developed this document, talked about what your house would look like, transportation, stores and shops, a supermarket, a furniture store, a moving picture theater. The, the document is fantastic, and it actually shows the different types of houses. And it also has the rents. The uh, type A house was $38 per month. That includes all utilities, garbage pickup, everything you would would want. From this evidence, David Bradshaw has built a picture of what this place looked like. In just a few months, 10,000 family homes, 90 dormitory buildings, and over 5,000 trailers were built to accommodate a workforce of thousands. The first workers moved in on July 27, 1943. They came in their thousands from all over the U.S., answering job advertisements to join the war effort. When I was interviewed, I said, I'm interested in uh, some kind of war work. He said, well, this is vital war work. I said, well, where will I be working? He says, well, I can't tell you. It's secret. I said, well, what will I be doing? He said, well, I can't tell you that. It's secret. I remember coming here and we had to be stopped at the gate. They searched the car. It was scary, it really was. And then when we got into the area 
it was scarier still because you think you come into a town, there was no town. Uh, there were just trailers, rows and rows of trailers and huts and all this temporary housing, a lot of mud, and you weren't supposed to ask any questions. Although they didn't know it, these people were on the front line in a war. Secrecy dominated their lives. We had many, many posters up. What you see here, what you hear here, when you leave here, let it stay here. So we knew if we found out anything, you know, don't breathe it, don't tell it. Now, with the basic structures in place, the security, the manpower, and the resources, the real work could finally begin. 95% of the people who worked at Oak Ridge had no idea of what they were involved in. But we can now understand exactly what they achieved. Building the bomb would require vast uranium processing plants, which would lead to the largest construction project that the world had ever seen. As part of the Manhattan Project, the U.S. military built a secret base at Oak Ridge, Tennessee during World War II. Hidden from the world was a city for 75,000 workers and a nuclear processing plant called Y-12. The race was on to enrich enough uranium for the world's first atomic bomb. 100 pounds of uranium was required. Its production demanded an extraordinarily complex process that had never been attempted before. What followed was to be the most costly and most labor-intensive engineering program in history. The vast Y-12 complex is still highly secret, still an active nuclear facility. Ray Smith, manager here for many years, is searching what remains of the World War II buildings for clues to tell their extraordinary story. In 1943, General Groves, who ran the Manhattan Project, ordered the immediate construction of nine huge industrial buildings. Below us is the Y-12 National Security Complex. It was built as a major part of the Manhattan Project. If you look, you can see three of the nine major buildings. The cost to construct these buildings was $427 million. They are made out of concrete and steel, and the materials were all brought in here, truckloads and train loads of materials to build this huge facility. Each of the nine buildings averaged 300 by 500 feet in size. They all remain standing today, and they contain evidence of how this massive industrial plant was initially conceived. At the beginning, when they were planning these industrial buildings, the nine of them, they didn't really know what the equipment would look like that needed to be in there. But they knew that they needed to be large buildings and that the equipment would likely be heavy. So it was built with the huge cranes to lift in any design that might be needed for the equipment that would be installed to obtain the uh, enriched uranium for the first bomb. Producing uranium for an atomic bomb was completely uncharted territory. Speed was of the essence, and there was no time to experiment or test the process. You had to compress everything into one phase, basically. You were doing your research and development pilot phase uh, at the very same time you were uh, designing a, a massive building that was going to be the uh, industrial facility to make it on a huge scale. Only one of the war-era buildings still houses its original uranium processing equipment. It's called Beta-3, and it was used for uranium separation right up to 1998. Until recently, the exact details of its processes, its location, and construction were matters of national security. But by exploring the secret history behind this equipment, Ray Smith can now reveal what happened here. This equipment, the Kalutrons, were actually built by using magnets on either side of a vacuum chamber. These units are very heavy. That's why the structure was built uh, as sturdy as it was to hold the large single magnet that went all the way around this rectangular shape. 
they were to be the largest and most expensive electromagnets ever built. To work, they needed miles of copper wire. But this was wartime, and all the available copper was being used to make bullets and shells. Grove's men hit on a drastic alternative. Someone had the bright idea, said, why not use silver? Well, uh, that's, that's a very good conductor, but where were you going to get it? Uh, well, you could go to the Treasury of the United States and decide to get uh, what eventually were 14,000 tons of silver that were literally taken out of the uh, depository and melted down and turned into the wiring for the magnets at Y-12. Once Groves had borrowed the Treasury silver, the machinery known as calutrons could be built. We can now reveal how this equipment worked. Uranium would be heated and fed out into the enormously powerful magnetic field. This force would be enough to separate tiny amounts of weapons-grade uranium-235 from the original raw material. 38 magnets make up one set of calutrons, and there are 36 calutrons in this building. In total, there were 1,152 calutrons on the site. The magnets were so large that they had to keep people away from them, and they couldn't use any tools that might be attracted by the magnets. In fact, they put a red line to warn people not to go any closer. If you did and you happened to have something in your pocket that was metal like a pocket knife, it would suck it right up against there, and it would hold you there. You couldn't get it off. And in fact, to get it off, you'd have to cut the material around the object to get away. Evidence shows that the power consumed was so vast that for the duration of its wartime mission, Project X would use one-seventh of all electricity generated in the United States. 1,152 machines ran 24 hours a day, seven days a week for a whole year. These machines were operated not by scientists, but by female high school graduates. They were called the Calutron Girls, and they had little idea of what they were involved in. We knew we were doing something towards the war effort, but it was a surprise. And uh, we, we were glad that we could contribute to that. You had uh, dials that you had to get. That maybe this dial lower and this dial higher. The units that they were monitoring, they actually sat in front and would turn these knobs as needed. They were actually rheostats that would change the current going to the magnets and the calutrons. But they didn't know that. All they knew was this meter needs to stay on a certain number and I adjust this one or I adjust this one to make it move one way or the other. They had no idea what they were actually doing. Nothing was ever said. If you talked about anything, it's, what did you do last night? Where did you go? But not about work. I saw the girls was young, pretty, and uh, very sociable. And we enjoyed each other. Ray has learned that the scientists still weren't convinced these young high school girls were capable of doing this crucial job. So they set up a contest where the scientists operated one bay of controls for the calutrons, and the calutron girls operated another one. They ran the, for a week like that. And at the end of the week, the calutron girls beat the scientists hands down. 2,000 Calutron girls worked in shifts for six months, but the process proved so inefficient that only seven pounds of uranium-235 were produced. Time was running out. No matter how innovative the engineering, to have any hope of meeting the target, a second plant would now have to be brought online at Project X. And this would require the construction of the biggest building in the world. This crumbling edifice was once the biggest building in the world. 
Called K-25, it was a key building in the Manhattan Project, and it was designed to increase production of the desperately needed uranium-235. Today, K-25 is inaccessible. It's highly contaminated. But our experts will discover what this building looked like and find the clues to the community that worked to build it. 1943. American forces are engaged in a vicious battle with the Japanese for control of the Pacific. The need to develop the atomic bomb is as great as ever. If they are going to produce the 100 pounds needed to build the bomb, scientists need to find new ways to obtain the precious U-235. The solution was a new type of enrichment plant. If building the town at Oak Ridge and the vast electromagnetic separation plant had sapped resources, this new phase was to present the greatest challenge so far. They authorized the construction of a gaseous diffusion plant. It was a much more difficult engineering problem. It really was a bigger gamble as far as uh, General Groves and his people were concerned. To get the job done, they would have to construct the biggest building in the world. They chose a site 11 miles from the secret city of Oak Ridge. The first pour of concrete alone would cover 200,000 cubic yards. Entire companies were requisitioned to provide the thousands of tons of materials needed. Thousands of construction workers were required. Historian David Bradshaw is convinced that they were housed near the site, but nothing today survives of this enormous settlement. The army right across the highway built a entire community, temporary in nature, nicknamed Happy Valley by its residents, but it wasn't so temporary that it didn't have things like a school, it had theaters, a recreation hall, stores. Essentially, when the war ended, the army tore down the entire community. Some of the structures were built on foundations and footers, which we think may still exist. So we're going to see what we can find and see if we can find some clues to the community called Happy Valley. Happy Valley was built in 1943, and David calculates that it housed 15,000 people. It consisted of row upon row of trailers. Despite the fact that the site is now overgrown by woodland, Clues to what this town once looked like are everywhere. I think right through here is a fire hydrant in the middle of the woods. Of course, it wouldn't be in the middle of the woods 60 years ago. It would have been in the middle of this bustling city, which is called Happy Valley. And really, everywhere you look, even though this is just the woods today, you see bits and pieces of the thousands of people who lived here. The ground is still flattened where the roads used to run. There are remains of sewage channels and water tunnels across the site. I think this is a telephone pole. It looks like it probably powered a facility, and I think this foundation was probably it. Looks like a uh, perm definitely a permanent structure. This, this is part of a laboratory, I'm sure, a toilet. And it probably would have sat just like that over this. And it looks like over here, there is a, what's probably, I imagine was the sink. So this was probably a uh, men's laboratory for the Hutman area. Using evidence from the site, as well as original plans, David's been able to bring back to life the temporary settlement of Happy Valley. For 24 months between 1943 and 1944, this was a thriving town. Inhabitants were housed in trailers and endured difficult conditions while they were constructing the K-25 facility. This is the building that they were working to complete. It may be a ruin today, but exploring the site reveals clues to K-25's top secret past. At a cost of $512 million, 10 billion today, it's the size of 35 football fields, 
built just to produce 100 pounds of processed uranium. That's an absolutely fantastic structure. The building itself is uh, four stories high on this side, the outside. And uh, rather than building a mile long building, mm -hmm. they folded it into a U shape. And what you're looking at is one leg of this U. This is a half uh -huh. mile long. Each of the legs is 400 feet wide. The reason that K-25 had to be so enormous was that the processes going on inside were so complex. Gaseous diffusion works by filtering the uranium-238 in gas form to produce the weapons-grade uranium-235. It's so inefficient, the process has to be repeated many thousands of times. But such was the desperate need to enrich uranium to fuel a bomb that no obstacle was too big. It was and still is uh, the largest building that was built in the Manhattan Project days. It's the largest relic that remains. Uh, and it is just now, as we speak, uh, in the process of being taken, taken down. Today, K-25 is strictly off limits, but using original plans and eyewitness testimony, we can reveal what this building would have looked like when it was completed in 1944. Documents show that it occupied two million square feet. It was a half mile long by 1,000 feet wide. It housed 758 miles of copper tubing, 3,800 miles of electrical conductors and the amount of water used in its processes would have supplied a city of five million. When K-25 began operations, it's recorded that it took a team of 12,000 just to hunt for leaks in the piping, which had to be completely airtight. Well, my job was to find the leaks in the wells in the pipe and the pipes would come in from overhead and stop at my station. We found the leak in the pipe and we marked it. And then the millwrights would come and take the pipe off to be uh, welded and sent back. And that was just all day. We just wondered what the pipes, they were big pipes, little pipe, pipes with elbows, all kinds of pipes. And of course, security was as tight as ever. This is my badge that I used when I worked at K-25. <laughs> I could go to the restroom, I could go to the cafeteria, and I could go to my workstation, but no place else. After a supreme effort, K-25 began producing the desperately needed enriched uranium, which would enable Project X to meet its target in the race to build the bomb. In July 1944, an armed guard took the first sample of uranium on a 2,000-mile journey from Oak Ridge to New Mexico, where some of the greatest scientists the world has ever known were waiting to work on it. It would be in the buildings of another secret city that the bomb would be armed, tested, and built. That place remains highly classified even today. It is the laboratory at Los Alamos. Deep in the heart of New Mexico is the most important site of the Manhattan Project, Los Alamos. This is still a top secret facility for the design of nuclear weapons. But in the 1940s, it was known simply as Project Y. This was the site where the bombs that ended World War II were designed and built. Very little remains of the original Manhattan Project buildings. But our team of experts will search historic documents and crumbling ruins for clues to reveal how this place looked. Archaeologist John Isaacson has studied the Los Alamos site to understand why Groves and his scientific director, J. Robert Oppenheimer, chose this location. We're at the site of the um, original main gate to the laboratory that was established in 1943. 
they were looking for a place that was remote, and in those days this was very remote, and that also did not uh, have any security vulnerabilities because of the terrain that provided the best suite of characteristics that they were looking for to put a laboratory here. When Groves and Oppenheimer came here for the first time, this site was home to the elite ranch school. The boys were rushed through their graduation, the land was requisitioned, and the engineers moved in. The main school hall, Fuller Lodge, remains standing today. And this really became sort of the social center of the Manhattan Project. A lot of social events took place here. As with Oak Ridge, Los Alamos was built very quickly. Its accommodation consisted of temporary homes and trailers. Oppenheimer would later become known as the father of the atomic bomb. He was tasked with gathering some of the finest brains in America to work with him in this isolated location. You've just come from a prestigious university on the east coast of the United States or perhaps from Europe. You're recruited to work on a secret project you don't even know where them, you're told to report to a train station in Lamy, New Mexico. First thing you ask is, where's Lamy? You're taken on a day-long journey over rutted, muddy roads into this encampment that basically looks like it comes out of the middle of nowhere. You're now told, here's where you're going to conduct one of the most innovative and creative scientific endeavors in the history of mankind. You might have thought that you were absolutely crazy and had gone nuts, but that was the reality of those days. It's clear that the conditions in which this elite group of scientists worked were very basic. This was a site that was built very rapidly by the Army. They used whatever materials were available. They brought in lumber and they erected shanties and shacks in which they conduct experiments that were to revolutionize mankind. Over the course of three years, over 600 technical buildings were constructed. Now, only 30 of them remain, in amongst the modern buildings of today's laboratory. John Isaacson and Ellen McGee are focusing on the site where engineers created the weapon to detonate the first atomic bomb. It takes detective work to piece together the details of what this building looked like and exactly what happened here. We're at a building called the Gun Site, or also known as the Periscope Bunker. And it's the site where the uranium gun device, the uranium gun weapon, was designed. The theory was simple. Shoot one piece of uranium down a barrel to collide with another. The two pieces would fuse together. A nuclear detonation would result. But in practice, the explosion had to be perfectly timed. This building was where scientific theory became an engineering reality. What was done here was working out the ballistics, muzzle velocities of these projectiles inside the bomb that were shooting into each other to see if they could get sufficient speed to have the weapon successfully assemble before it exploded. By studying the plans, our experts have discovered that this structure supported a tower that served as a periscope. This device would have enabled the scientists to observe and record each shot while they were protected from shrapnel in the building below. We're pretty sure that the, the inside of this periscope tower, uh, it was light tight, so that they would have probably been using it to um, take photographs of the actual tests that were happening right above. The presence of these bolts indicates where powerful naval guns were anchored to the ground and shells were fired in full view of the periscope. This is an area where we think that the uh, naval guns uh, were situated. You would have been able to have a clear shot between the guns mounted here and the periscope structure that is just a, a little bit to the north. Using their findings, the experts can now bring this lost world to life. The gun sight and periscope were built into the landscape, and the bunker was covered with a protective three-foot layer of earth. The naval cannon on top of the bunker would have fired the ordnance. High-speed movie cameras mounted in the periscope would have allowed the scientists to calibrate the speed and power of the explosion. 
they would fire these weapons and they would understand in, with great precision and detail the speed of the projectiles, the time it took from the ignition of the charge until the projectile began moving. Those minor details were very important in ensuring that they could assemble the critical mass necessary to sustain the nuclear reaction. The tests at the gun site gave the engineers the data they needed to build a bomb they were confident would work. But then, a new scientific breakthrough indicated that it might now be possible to build a bomb from a new substance, plutonium, which would prove even more destructive than the uranium device. And this bomb would require the building of a totally new test site and would present the engineers at Los Alamos with their biggest challenge yet. This is the V-Site at Los Alamos, a collection of ramshackle sheds, abandoned for years. Our investigators are here because it was in these buildings that some of the most dangerous experiments of the Manhattan Project took place. By studying new evidence, it's possible to understand what this lost world looked like and what happened here. By 1944, a uranium-fueled nuclear bomb was near completion. But scientists at Los Alamos had been presented with another possibility, to make an even more destructive bomb from a different kind of fuel. This totally new material that was discovered, and that is plutonium, uh, and the scientists had actually been able to do enough calculations to try to understand that plutonium would probably be a better bomb than uranium. So a new race was underway. A whole complex of buildings was constructed at Los Alamos. This area is called V-Site, but during the war, this was actually called Technical Area 25. They, they came out here and used this little area as a special sort of um, high security secret area for working on the implosion device. The engineers were entering uncharted territory but they knew that what they were going to attempt was highly dangerous and would require a new type of explosives research. The idea is to start with a sphere of plutonium and to compress it using high explosives to a point where now it could sustain a critical reaction. This was a challenge for explosive development. Normally with explosives we would blow things up, not try to blow them inward. And so the implosion concept was created. The military needed this work done fast, so no time was lost in building the explosives workshops. A lot of this stuff was salvaged from other construction Absolutely. projects because when they decided to build this area, it was just like, come on, we gotta get a place to put this together, grab some stuff from other places around the, la uh, around the laboratory and throw it together and get us a building as quick as you can. The designers knew that the people working at the V-Site would be handling powerful, often unstable, high explosives. The experts have been able to identify a series of safety precautions which were built. This is part of a, a, a surface that was around the buildings in this whole area. And this is a, a spark uh, suppressant material that was on the ground because they're working with high explosives. There wasn't just the threat of sparks. There was also New Mexico's freak weather to contend with. This is one of the highest lightning strike areas in the United States. So uh, during the summer, during the monsoon period, we get lots of lightning. And so lightning is a major issue in this whole high explosives area. The engineer's role at the V-Site was to pack the explosives tightly around the plutonium core and to verify that there wasn't even the smallest gap as this might disrupt the critical detonation process, which had to be totally uniform. The big fear was that in such high-risk operations, an accident might ignite the many tons of TNT stored in the huts. And so key buildings were surrounded by protective outer walls called berms. Now this is the berm back here behind us, of course, that was that was built as a protective device for the high explosives. And these berms really were designed uh, during the project to protect 
people and buildings behind it so that if there, it would limit the damage if there was an accident. Using original plans and new evidence from the site, our experts now understand how this protective technique worked. Next to each workshop, a 12-foot berm was erected, held in place by shock-absorbing metal rods and backfilled with earth. In the event of an explosion, there would be no saving the people inside. The purpose of the berm was to protect the surrounding area. The ordnance engineers who were sent into the workshops to assemble the high explosive charges were aware of the dangers they faced. One of them was George Kistiakowski. Kistiakowski was asked by uh, someone, you know, weren't you afraid of, you know, drilling into these high explosives and pouring in this molten high explosives that they would explode? And he said, well, you know, if it exploded, I would never know. So he was pretty blasé about the whole thing. And I think they had an attitude that a certain level of risk was acceptable because, because it was wartime. By May 1945, two implosion bombs had successfully been built. The engineers persuaded the military to let them test one of these precious new devices. But there was great concern. Should the test fail, the plutonium might all be wasted. Ellen McGee has been studying this strange concrete bowl, which she reveals was a device to salvage the precious plutonium. They were worried that when they did the test, that, um, that basically the conventional explosives would detonate, but they wouldn't have an atomic reaction and that the world's or close to the world's supply of plutonium would just basically get scattered to the winds. The engineer's solution was to build this huge bowl over 220 yards in diameter. If the plutonium didn't detonate, the exploding TNT would simply scatter it into this pool. The water would be filtered and the plutonium collected. But with time running out, this approach was abandoned. The engineers decided to proceed with the test without attempting to recover the plutonium if it failed. The world's first test of a nuclear bomb was set for the 16th of July, 1945, to take place in a huge area of desert 200 miles south of Los Alamos called Alamogordo. Before this first detonation, the engineers feared that the bomb might not be powerful enough, or worse, that they had created something that was entirely uncontrollable. So one of the great uncertainties associated with the first test was how much energy that the test would produce. What would be the yield of the weapon? Indeed, scientists took a number of wagers as to whether or not the ignition of that device might cause a reaction between the nitrogen and the oxygen in the atmosphere, and thus ignite the atmosphere and cause a total conflagration. 27 months of work. Vast human and material resources mobilized in secret at a cost of over $2 billion. It all culminated here with the detonation of the first atomic bomb. The local population reported a blinding white flash visible for a radius of 150 miles and audible for 200 miles around. A press release was prepared ahead of time uh, saying that an uh, ammunition dump uh, had exploded and that was what caused the um, bright light to occur on the dawn of uh, July 16th. And uh, lo and behold, that was printed in the paper and uh, people I suppose, said, well, I guess that was an ammunition dump and uh, took the newspaper at its word. Few witnesses realized they had seen something which would define history. The greatest force for destruction that the world had ever seen, born from the largest construction project ever undertaken. Uh, the logistics are mind-boggling. I mean, it takes 27 months these days to do an environmental impact statement. Uh, and these gentlemen were able to put everything together in that time frame. Three weeks after the test, the first uranium bomb would explode over the Japanese city of Hiroshima, and the plutonium bomb would destroy Nagasaki three days after that. With war over, 
these buildings were allowed to fade and crumble. They were hidden behind razor wire fences and a wall of secrecy. Communities like Happy Valley disappeared from sight forever. But their legacy lives on in a new generation of technological secrets born out of the lost world of the Manhattan Project.